Hi everybody, welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman and tonight we're going to be talking about From Dust to the Stars. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing and coming in together that we may study your word. We pray that you will bless us this evening as we study Daniel chapter 12 and its end time significance. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'd like to start off by looking at uh, this week's memory text, which is Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. The Bible says, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Uh, the book of Daniel begins with uh, Nebuchadnezzar invading Judea and taking captives to Babylon. And the book of Daniel concludes, in, in contrast, with, Mike, with Michael standing up to deliver God's people from the end-time Babylon. And we've been talking in recent weeks about uh, who that end-time Babylon system is. Uh, and we gave some uh, clear-cut references, uh, as well as some history and historical facts that go with it. Uh, God works everything out in favor of his people. So in spite of the madness and the chaos that we see going on throughout the world, uh, including um, you know, what we see even going on today, uh, we know the end of the story before we've actually arrived at the end. And the end of the story is that God is going to deliver his people and, he, and he's showing them favor. Daniel and his companions remain faithful to God and display unparalleled wisdom amid the trials and challenges that they faced during the exile. Uh, God's end time people must also remain faithful uh, as they as they uh, face a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, um, no, nor ever shall be. So one of the things, like, just in context, you know, one of the things that I've been hearing from people, uh, especially throughout this week, is, you know, uh, with the coronavirus pandemic that's been going around, is, is this the end? Have we arrived at the end? Is is the world about to end, uh, you know, as we, as we know it? Um, because the Bible does say in Daniel chapter 12 that there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. But fortunately, we have not yet reached that point in time yet. And one of the ways that we know that is by looking at what Paul had to say in um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, where he says, uh, That day shall not come, except there come first a falling away, and the man of sin be revealed. So that's how we know we haven't yet arrived at the end, because we know that there's one final end time deception coming in which all will have to take sides, all will choose whom they worship. So are we going through tribulation? Are we going through difficulty now? Is is now uh, looking like a time of trouble? Sure. But we have not yet reached the end in which uh, there will be a controversy in which everybody's going to make a decision over the issue of worship. So that's how we know where we are in, in, the, in, the, in the historic timeline. And God's people in the end times will, will need to display wisdom and understanding. Daniel chapter 12 also uh, makes a statement. Uh, it's, it's actually one of the first clear-cut references to the resurrection in Scripture. Um, I mean, there are other references elsewhere, but this one was, was, was very, very clear-cut. Where Daniel says in verse 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and contempt. Sorry, and, and contempt. Um, <clears throat> so we can see that even those who fall asleep have this opportunity to be resurrected. And God, whether whether his people are dead or alive, he's going to come for them. And um, if they're dead, he will raise them up so that they can enjoy eternity with him. So let's focus on Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. <clears throat> The Bible says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. As we've talked about in previous lessons, um, the, term, the name Michael, or the title of Michael, actually means one who is like God. Looking at that from that perspective, Jesus is actually uh, Michael, uh, and we see like several references to this. I don't uh, that that in and of itself would be a Bible study, so I'm not going to go through all the references that show how Jesus uh, and Michael are actually the same entity. But Michael is actually not an angelic being or a created being. Um, he his title simply means that he is the leader of the angels, or he is like prince over all the angels. 
um, but that but not not saying that he is an actual um, angel or messenger or or created being for that matter. Prior to Jesus being uh, becoming a human being, uh, he was on equal level with God. Uh, Philippians makes that very clear. Philippians chapter two verse six says, "Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God." So we know that Jesus uh, was on the same level with God. He's he's a uh, divine being. And, uh, you know, as first, as uh, John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 3 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus is God. Uh, but prior to becoming Jesus in, uh, in his human form, uh, his, his name or title at the time was Michael. And it kind of makes sense because the great controversy has always been between Christ and Satan. And when you look at Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says in the... Uh, and, um, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels uh, and prevailed not um, th th and therefore was a place not found for them in heaven anymore. So when Satan was cast out of heaven, he was cast out by Michael. But really, Michael was the name or the title of Jesus prior to, be prior to becoming a human being. So, and we know from the other scriptures like in, in John chapter 1 and also what we read in Philippians that Jesus is God. So putting all of that together, uh, Michael is actually not an angel. He's called the archangel as a title, meaning that he is the prince of or the leader of all the angels. Um, but that, but, but he's not a, a, a created being. He's on the same level with God. They were co-equal throughout eternity. So it's significant in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, Michael, that great prince, will stand up. Because that means that Jesus stands up, and at that point, the intercession period is over. Probation is closed. Mercy has come to an end. And now it's time for judgment. Let's take a look at some other scriptures. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 34. The Bible says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, uh, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? And then I'm also going to look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, which says, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. This passage shows us that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and at some point in time he stands up for his people, and he ends his work of intercession, uh, which he does continually on our behalf. So every chapter of Daniel so far has begun with by, by mentioning the ruler of a pagan nation and, and what they were doing in order to conquer or in order to um, uh, dominate others. But Daniel 12 begins with a different kind of ruler. But unlike every other chapter, this ruler is a divine prince who rises to deliver God's people from the hands of their enemies. So Michael is the same powerful heavenly being who appears to Daniel at the, at the Tigris River as the heavenly representative of God's people. And like I was saying before, uh, Jesus has many titles. He's called Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7. He's called Prince of the Host in Daniel chapter 8. He's called Messiah the Prince in Daniel chapter 9. And he's called Michael here in Daniel chapter 12. And that name again means who is like God or one who is like God. It's important for us to note the timing of Michael's intervention. Because according to Daniel chapter 12 verse 1, it occurs at that time. And this, is, this expression here is referring to the time of the end. Because we've just reached the end of Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 40 to 45. And so we're talking about um, that, that uh, this, this, this is the period of time that extends from, from the fall of the papacy in 1798 to the resurrection at the end time in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. So in between that time, uh, we see that Michael is at some point going to stand up. And, that, uh, and when he stands up, probation will close and the work of intercession will be over. And now it will be time... For judgment. So there are two important aspects to Michael's work. First, that he, uh, if we look at the word at the verb to stand, that's utilized in Daniel chapter twelve verse one. Um, stand sort of evokes the rise of kings uh, to, to to conquer and to rule. So the verb also primarily con uh, connotes a military sense. And remember that throughout Scripture, whenever we see Michael, we we always see him in a military capacity in direct conflict with the devil. And he protects God's people and leads them in a special way during the last stages of, 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 this, of this great controversy. 
Now, second, the verb stand also points to a judgment setting. Michael stands uh, to, to act as an advocate in the heavenly tribunal. Michael's rising or, or standing evokes the military and judicial aspects of his work. And so he is invested with power to defeat God's enemies and with the authority to represent God's people in the heavenly tribunal. And so I am glad that in the last days, Michael is going to be standing up. See, in times past, whenever there's been persecution, whenever there's been problems, um, you know, God hasn't always uh, taken direct action or direct involvement, especially not on this level. He, he may take action, you know, like, for example, when, where he rescued Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He may have taken action uh, when he rescued Dango from the lion's den. Uh, so, he, so, so but, but in this case, uh, he's taking action and coming himself. Uh, just like, uh, you know, we, we saw an example of that when, when uh, Jesus was with the three Hebrews in the fire. Uh, but this suggests that not only is he standing and, and making a personal appearance, uh, but he's bringing all of his heavenly army with him. He's coming as commander in chief. So in other words, he's not just coming like for an isolated incident, uh, you know, just coming um, to make an appearance by himself. He's coming with the army and he's coming uh, and he means business. Uh, so that's that's really what the difference is this time around compared to times past. In times past, we've seen him make appearances, but this time he's coming to to make an end and to and to uh, you know to to execute judgment. So like in, in times of persecution, you know uh, God's people have gone through different trials and tribulations, and they've been um, you know attacked by different nations. But now, rather than them fighting uh, the battles, God is going to fight the battles. And it kind of reminds me of that passage where God says. You know, uh, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And at this point, he's coming back to repay. Uh, so God's people are not going to have to fight their end time battles. God is going to fight the battle. God's end time people are just going to be faithful and be witnesses of, uh, for him. So Daniel 12, 1 talks about those who are found written in the book. And I, I'm going to take a comment because I saw uh, uh, Andrew wanted to make a statement. So let me uh, put him on screen with us. Uh, just want to bring out uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. It says, says something important there. It says, uh, I think I have to read this part too, such as never was nation. Okay, just before that, it says, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was such in, even to that time. And then it says something important. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And it discusses, the quarterly discusses that book, and that book is the book of life. That's right. The book of the saved. The book of the redeemed. Mm -hmm. The book of the forgiven. And so, uh, just say, uh, bring out really quickly what that, pe what that people are going to be like. Uh, from Zephaniah, I found it in Zephaniah, if you want to turn there with me, if you want to turn there a little bit after me. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. It says, Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. And then the Bible says something very important. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. And so God wants to hide us, hide us from the troubles and the persecution and the hate and the brokenness of this world and the pain and the suffering. He wants to hide us from Amen. that as much as he can. And so in order to do that, we got to uphold his justice. We got to uphold his justice. We got to do righteousness. We got to seek his face. We got to seek Jesus. We got to seek the Lord. We got to seek humility. We got to seek righteousness. And then we'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. anger. Amen. So, you know, there's, there's uh, some preparation that needs to be done for us uh, if we expect to be ready at that time. Thank you, Andrew. Let's take a look again. Uh, we're focusing on Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. And, and uh, like Andrew was saying before, um, you know, when, when we talk about the book here, we're talking about the book of life. And what's interesting is that Revelation chapter 14, um, as well as, uh, actually I actually think uh, chapter 13 as well, uh, kind of mirrors some of this language here. Because when you look at Revelation chapter, so, so like here you see that the people who are delivered are everyone that, are, that is found written in the book, right? But now let's fast forward a little bit to uh, Revelation. And we find a very interesting 
um, statement that's made here. Okay, so Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. The Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So notice here that those whose names are not written in the book uh, will worship the beast. But here in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, uh, we find that all the people who get delivered are the ones whose names are written in the book. So essentially, this is as, as if to say that God has a title deed to heaven and he protects us and keeps us safe. And he get, and, and, and uh, if our names are found written in this book, uh, then we have an inheritance. Um, I, I once was reading a commentary where it was talking about that. Um, because like when, when, when it uses the phrase book, it's like, you know, you think about like a book that you read like literature. Uh, whereas um, this particular document that, that's being referred to here as, as the book of life. Um, may also be sort of like a, a title deed, meaning like the title to the inheritance of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of Christ. Because, you know, when you, when, you, um, when you die, usually people leave a will and a testament to their children so that um, because you're, you're now deceased, uh, the children will then inherit, or it's the spouse in some cases, if the spouse is, is, is still alive, will then inherit uh, all the assets that were acquired uh, by the deceased. So in this case, Jesus is the deceased and on his will, so to speak, which is essentially what we could compare to the book, which, uh, what we're comparing to the book of life, uh, his, his, this, this, this document contains uh, the names of his people uh, who therefore inherit uh, his assets. And so if our names are written on the book of life, uh, then that means that we have an inheritance through Christ. Um, and that's how we become heirs according to the promise. <clears throat> so that being said, um, that's why I'm using this, this, this term, that, uh, a title deed. Uh, but really what we're talking about here is the book of life. I'm just uh, explaining like what a commentator once, uh, I once read, uh, how, how he described the book of life or, or the book of life's function. Um, but whether or not you go with that commentary or not, the point is that there is a book of life and um, it has the names of God's people written on it. And because their names are written there, they will inherit everlasting life. <clears throat> so God's spirit will be withdrawn from the rebellious, from rebellious humankind, just like we saw in the, in the flood. Uh, because remember that God that Jesus said, uh, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Well, what happened specifically during the days of Noah? Well, if we go back to scripture, uh, the Bible says, my, my spirit will not always strive with man. So humanity can get to a point, just like back in the flood, where the thoughts and imaginations of their hearts are only evil continuously. And because they are only evil continuously, God's spirit will only strive with them for but so long, and then will begin to withdraw from the earth. And at the point where the spirit has been withdrawn from the earth, then the judgment will come. And so in this case, uh, rebellious humanity will again reach a point where the thoughts and imaginations of everyone's hearts are only evil continuously, and God's spirit will be, with, will be withdrawn from the earth. Then we'll see the seven last plagues as expressions of God's wrath upon the nations. It will be poured out upon the end time Babylon. And that kind of uh, brings me to why I'm hearing a lot of people ask me uh, in recent weeks, have we reached the end? Uh, is the coronavirus an example of one of these seven last plagues? Uh, how much time do we have left? So the coronavirus is not uh, one of the seven last plagues. Because remember, we, haven't, we, we, still, we still have another thing that needs to happen before the end can come. Uh, and that is the falling away must continue uh, and the man of sin must be revealed and must work that end time deception that we just read about in Revelation chapter 13, where it says all whose names are not written in the book of life all upon the earth will worship him. And so there's going to be one final conflict in the end of time that brings us into this controversy over the issue of worship. However, that being said, uh, I do think that the coronavirus or uh, many different disasters that, that, that occur in our time uh, can take us in the direction that's to set us up for these things. You might ask how. Well, let's think about this for a minute. Why is it that the beast power of Revelation 13 is so successful 
at deceiving the whole world. Well, if we go to Revelation chapter 13, this is what it says. <clears throat> I'm going to read from verse 13. I'm sorry, from, from verse 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the, them that dwell on the earth, which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now, why is that significant? Well, remember that one of the reasons why everybody wonder, uh, wonders after the beast, why everybody decides to worship and to go along with this whole thing, is because of the miracles which the beast has power to do. And so if you think about it, all you really need is some type of global disaster. It could be a disease. It could be a, uh, um, a series of earthquakes. It could be some other natural disaster, tsunami, um, uh, hurricane, whatever it might be. And it has to be bad enough where it creates a global impact and where people begin to panic. And then all you need is for this miracle working uh, imposter to come on the scene and cause these things to stop and just like that everybody will wonder after the beast because they've never seen miracles like this performed before you can't be an atheist after you've seen these sort of things happen so I don't know what exactly is going to be the, the, the final straw the one thing that creates the need for this uh, power to um uh, to to uh, begin working the miracles and, and to come on the scene as, as it is described here in Revelation 13. But we do know that it's coming. There's going to be a need for it. Um, and then it's going to, and then uh, this, this, this beast power is going to supply what people think they want. It could be uh, making people think that they're healed. It could be making people think um, that uh, some disaster is averted. We don't know. But we do know that he's going to work miracles. And because of those miracles that he has the power to do, everybody is going to worship him except those whose names are written on the book of, in the book of life. And just like is said elsewhere, Satan has this ability to transform himself into an angel of light. And because he does that, and because people don't know the truth, and because people are not expecting these things, a lot of people are going to be deceived because he's not going to appear as something that's apparently deceptive. He's going to appear as something that's everything that people think they want. So going back to the book of Daniel, we see that everyone whose name is written in the book of life will be preserved at this time. And Michael, the great prince who was really uh, Christ, is going to stand up for his people. Now, on the flip side, when we look at Revelation chapter 13, we see that everybody whose names are not written in the book of life are basically going to go down the same path with this, with this beast power. So that's how we know that we're not at the end yet, because that has not yet taken place. Uh, we're still waiting for that, for that, for that to happen, uh, when, this, when this power will take control and everybody will worship it, thinking that it's, 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 it's Jesus. But obviously here, the difference comes down to character. Are we going to obey the law of God? Or are people going to just do their own thing? And as you look at Revelation chapter 16 and then Revelation chapter 18, verse 20 to 24, uh, you see that the end will come shortly after this controversy over worship in which the seven last plagues will be poured out and we'll see uh, God's wrath poured out upon, upon the world. In fact, uh, in this book called The Great Controversy, one writer puts it this way. She says, Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. But even though this time of trouble is going to happen, God is going to preserve his people through it. See, that, that brings us to another point, which is, you know, a lot of people think that there's going to be a secret rapture in which people just get raptured out and they don't have to face the time of trouble. That's not true. That's a lie. Um, 
God's people are going to be brought through the time of trouble, not raptured away from it. And that's why it's, it's significant in, Dan, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, that Michael stands up for the children of his people. So the Bible mentions two kinds of heavenly books. One contains the names of those who belong to the Lord and, and, and uh, is sometimes designated as the book of life. We see that in Exodus 32, verse 32, Luke 10, verse 20, uh, Psalm 69, verse 28, uh, Philippians 4, actually, I think that might be Philemon uh, 4, verse 3. Um, is it Philemon or Philippians? Let me just double check that. No, that would be um, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, Revelation 17, verse 8. <clears throat> uh, all of those passages contain references to these, to these books. Now, in addition to the book of life, the scriptures also mention books containing the records of human deeds. So uh, I think in some places they call that the book of remembrance. Um, and we'll see that, for example, in Psalm 56, verse 8, Malachi 3, verse 16, and Isaiah 65, verse 6. So these are the books uh, used in the heavenly tribunal uh, used in the heavenly tribunal to determine everyone's commitment to the Lord. Uh, another place where we see, um, like, for example, you, you remember in Daniel chapter 7 where it says the judgment was set and the books, plural, were opened. Um, then in Revelation chapter 20, we see another similar phrase. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, which says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So we see that there are a few other books, and then there's the book of life. And they're used in this judgment. And uh, verse 15 goes on to tell us, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So again, you're starting to see a lot of these similarities and, and correlations between Daniel and Revelation. The good news, though, is that once we commit our lives to Christ, our names are inscribed in the book of life and our bad deeds are deleted in the judgment. So uh, those things that were that, that were on, that, you know, that were in our past um, will be deleted, blotted out. And that's the work that Christ does in the heavenly sanctuary where he blots out the record of sin. So it does not count against us. We are looked at as if we had never sinned in the first place because our record is not there. And so this heavenly re uh, record provides judicial evidence uh, to the entire universe that we belong to Jesus and therefore have the right to be protected during the time of trouble. Now let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. We're going to focus on those two verses. Uh, so let me just go back there. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So here it's a clear-cut reference to what takes place at the second coming of Jesus, and it means that we will have an and that, that we will have everlasting life, and that we'll get to enjoy a new heaven and a new earth, uh, and a much better life without the, the pain and suffering that we experience in this life, because Daniel here makes a clear-cut uh, a, a, a clear-cut uh, reference to the resurrection. So there's going to be a resurrection of the just. There's going to be a resurrection of the unjust, and he says here. Some are going to awake to everlasting life. So notice here that he describes death as a sleep. Uh, and some are going to awake from that sleep to everlasting life. And some are going to awake to, from, uh, from that sleep to everlasting shame and contempt. And what's interesting is that when we, when we uh, compare that with um, Revelation chapter 20 again, notice the similarities here. Because Revelation chapter 20 kind of begins or picks up where the second coming has taken place. And let's see what it says. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. And, and he lay hold on, on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years be, should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose a little season. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Christ, of Christ, sorry, for, for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. 
but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it uh, from from whose face the earth and the and the heaven fled away, there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and, and, the, and hell, or the grave, delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works." And, and death and, and, and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. <clears throat> so here you can see a clear-cut reference to the second resurrection, the resurrection of damnation, just like Daniel described. So now when we go back to verses 2 and 3, with that, with uh, you know, and co comparing Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 and 3 to Revelation chapter 20, notice it says here that many of those who were sleeping in the dust shall awake, some to, er to everlasting life, just like we saw, uh, they'll reign and live with Christ for a thousand years. And then after that thousand year period, some uh, to shame and everlasting contempt. There'll be some that uh, will be with the devil um, uh, in the lake of fire. And so verse three tells us, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So in order for us to be bright, and be wise. There's a connection between that and doing what is right or righteousness. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, the Bible makes clear that um, Christ, through the cross, destroyed the devil, allowing the release of those who were in fear and in bondage. Um, so let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 18 for a minute. The Bible says, For I reckon that the suffering of, of, of this present time are not worthy to be... Sorry. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So even though we go through difficulty in this life, it's nothing compared to what we're going to inherit because of what Christ has done for us, even if we go through suffering now. Then we're going to compare that with Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, which says, For as much then as the children are partakers of, the, of, of flesh and blood, he also, talking about Christ himself, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So in this life, we go through a lot of things which kind of subject us to bondage and leave us in fear. Uh, the coronavirus would just be one example of that and how we're subject to fear because we're mortal. We're, we're, we can... We can be hurt. We can die. We can go through pain and suffering. But because of what Christ did for us, the Bible says that he has destroyed the one who has power over death. And he's speaking about the devil. So in spite of what hardships, difficulty, suffering, pain, or uh, diseases or, or challenges we might face in this life, Christ has the power over death so that even death itself does not have the final say over the believer. And I find that comforting, especially in a time like the present. So death does not hold the last word for faithful believers. Death is a, is a vanquished enemy. When Christ breaks the chains of death and emerges uh, resurrected from the tomb, he deals the fatal blow to death because now he has a power over death and he can share that power with human beings. So what's interesting is that at the point in Daniel 12, 1, where Michael stands up, he's coming to the earth with power for his people to stand up also. So his people uh, may be in the graves, but when Michael stands up, he's coming to the earth so that his people uh, can also stand up from the graves and join him in heaven. And at that point, many who are in the dust of the earth, or in the, the, the original Hebrew, in the original language, it says here, earth of dust, 
uh, will shine like the stars forever and ever. Uh, but earlier, I was just trying to get my point across, but I'm sorry. Uh, I think I made a mistake there. But um, I just want to bring out the point in Daniel chapter 12 again. Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Many shall be purified and refined, shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall, un but the wise shall understand. What that means to me is that the wicked, even throughout, the wicked have been limited in their power to deceive and attack God's people. And also, and also when the Bible was being written, the wicked couldn't understand what the Bible was talking about. So, because the wicked couldn't understand it, because spiritually things, spiritual things are spiritually discerned, because and because the wicked couldn't understand what the Bible was talking about about the papacy and whatnot things about deception the miracles and revelation the wicked couldn't understand that though so that the wicked couldn't destroy the Bible and destroy God's people that way God preserved the holy scriptures God preserved uh, writings that talk about Jesus and exalt his word, law and his word and Jesus has preserved these things and he has. He is, he, is, he has he's more than capable of purifying his church and finding and making white his church. He's more than capable of doing that. So going back to um, Daniel chapter 12, we're going to look at uh, verse 4 and then John chapter 14 and uh, verse 29. Uh, so let's look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 first. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Uh, then we got John chapter 14, verse 29. Let's go there for a moment. And, I, and now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. So because knowledge will be increased as it pertains to this particular time, uh, we, are get, we get information from God. Uh, so that we can we can have encouragement and, and, and so that we'll believe. So God tells us what's going to come down the road so that we can be encouraged rather than discouraged and believe. So a lot of people go through uh, difficult circumstances, you know, and, and you no, know, I hate to keep bringing up the, uh, the virus, but when we think about today, right, everybody's wondering, everybody's panicking, saying, is this going to be the thing that wipes out humanity? Is this going to be the thing that takes us out? But because of prophecy, we know that that is in fact not the case. And we don't worry the way that the rest of the world worries because we know that there's more to come. And we also know who's in control of human history. So in spite of the bad things that happen, God is still preserving his people and he's giving humanity warnings and letting them know that the time of the end is coming and that we need to be prepared for it and make a decision. So in the time of the end, knowledge of the book of Daniel is going to increase. Now, there are different ways that people interpret the passage where it says knowledge shall be increased. On, on one hand, some people say that knowledge increases in general, meaning that um, as people go you know, to and fro throughout the earth, uh, they're learning more. Uh, you know, and if you think about it, now we've got a global economy where uh, there's a lot of cultural diffusion that takes place. And if you think about what we know now compared to what we knew years ago, knowledge has definitely generally increased uh, to a great extent, right? We, we've learned a lot. Our scientific advances, our medical advances, our uh, contributions to art and culture, uh, we've, we've done a great deal. And even the fact that we're doing this broadcast right now and it can be streaming all over the world to different countries and to different parts of the world shows that we've grown tremendously with regard to knowledge. Uh, but another uh, take on that particular phrase is that knowledge increases in terms of the knowledge of the book of Daniel which would occur after 1798. So after 1798 begins this time that the Bible calls the time of the end. And in that time, uh, knowledge about the book of Daniel was supposed to increase as people began studying the prophecies. And so now that knowledge of the book of Daniel has increased, the things that were sealed by the time Daniel ended his book are made clear and plain. And, and we see a continuation of what Daniel wrote in the book of Revelation. And that's why you cannot understand the book of Revelation without understanding the book of Daniel. So in Daniel chapter 10, uh, verse 1, all the way down to Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, 
uh, we have the last major section of the book of Daniel. And the prophet receives the command to seal the scroll until the time of the end. But in the same breath, the angel, depict, uh, the, the angel predicts that many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. So people would begin to start studying uh, the book of Daniel. And Daniel remained an obscure piece. Uh, we, when we look at history, Daniel had, had remained an obscure piece of literature for centuries because people read through it. And when they read through the parts about the, the, the metal uh, in the image that, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream or the, or the, the four beasts that they saw in, in, in Daniel chapter 7, um, you know, the he-goat and the ram in, in, in Daniel chapter 8, uh, and certainly the 2300-day prophecy, nobody understood any of that. It was like gibberish. People were like, well, what is going on here? We don't get it. Um, <clears throat> but now those things have been made plain. Now we do have understanding of those. So in the last days, uh, we can see already that knowledge of the book of Daniel has greatly increased, and it even informs our understanding of Revelation. So from the Protestant Reformation onward, more and more people began to study the book of Daniel. However, it was only at the time of the end that the book finally was opened and its contents more fully unveiled. So from like around 1798, uh, people began to understand more and more about the prophecies of Daniel. And by uh, the at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, a, um, a new interest in, in the prophecies of Daniel sort of uh, came in, into uh, manifestation and uh not just Daniel, but also in the book of Revelation, and those were and they were widely studied, um, separate places throughout the earth. So if we look at, for example, uh, where the book of Daniel was studied, like roughly around this time period, we'll see that the study of these prophecies led to widespread belief that the second advent of of Christ was near. You had numerous expositors in England. You had Joseph Wolf in the Middle East, uh, Manuel Locanza in in South America, William Miller in the United States, and together with a host of other students of prophecies. Uh, they declared on on the basis of their study and the prop of the prophecies of Daniel that the, that the second advent was at hand. Today, this conviction has become the driving force of a worldwide movement that we know of as Seventh Day Adventism. When we've studied the Book of Daniel, because the knowledge of the Book of Daniel has greatly increased, uh, one of the things that it does is it gives us hope, because of the fact that if so many of Daniel's prophecies have already come to pass, then we know that what it says is yet to happen will come to pass and we can trust in God's word. And then it also lends credibility to the book of Revelation because if Daniel was right and John the Revelator picks up where Daniel left off in the book of Revelation, then we know that the prophecies of Revelation can also be trusted. And one of the clear cut reasons why the book of Daniel is so amazing, uh, I was talking with a friend of mine last night who's um, more on the agnostic spectrum of things. Uh, and, you know, uh, he, he frequently looks up research or he frequently looks up things to try and discredit uh, anything about the Bible, or, or at least, if not to discredit it, to question it. And so he found a resource, which he shared with me the other night, in which he said that, um, well, some, some scholars are saying uh, that the book of Daniel was written by uh, 164 B.C. And so I said, really? Um, and so he was saying, yeah, you know, so that's probably around when, when the book of Daniel would have been written. And, uh, and ultimately compiled uh, by many different authors. It would, have, it would have been written by 164 BC. So I said to him, if the book were written by 164 BC, now keep in mind, I believe that the book would have been written by roughly around 357 BC. But let's say I grant you and I say, okay, maybe it was written by 164 BC. And you're getting this information from what they call higher criticism. These are people who find all kinds of different reasons to discredit the Bible and not to acknowledge it. And so they look for excuses uh, to say that the books were, were written later than they actually were. But let's say they were right. Let's say higher criticism has it right and the book was written by 164 BC. Well, 164 BC is roughly around the time of the end of the Grecian Empire and the start of Rome. And so the problem that you have is that in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel chapter 8, as well as, uh, actually, uh, we can even talk about 11, it predicts events that occur after the fall of the Roman Empire. So if you're willing to give me that the book of Daniel would have had to have been written by 164 BC, as is stated by these higher critic sources, you still can't explain how the Bible predicts the collapse of the Roman Empire and the appearance of the little horn power that we now know of as the papacy, the period of persecution, 
and what takes place during the divided empire or the divided kingdom uh, that we now know of as modern day Europe and the events leading up to the second coming of Christ that we're already seeing in our current history. So how could Daniel have predicted, even if he had written it, even if it was written by 164 BC, how could, how could this book predict the events which, were, which would occur after the fall of Rome? And you can't give me a later date than 164 BC because of the fact that we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we know that the book is ancient. So now you have to explain how even if you want to discredit the first part of the prophecies, how is it, a, how is it able to predict what takes place after the fall of Rome and then all these other details down through the end of time? And that is a question that agnostics and atheists cannot answer. Now, granted, I believe that the book of Daniel would have been written by 357 BC. So at the time that Daniel wrote the book, he predicted the collapse of the Babylonian Empire, the collapse of, uh, well, not collapse, but uh, the fall of the Babylonian Empire to the Medes and the Persians, the fall of the Medes and the Persians to the Greeks, the fall of Greece to Rome, and then, of course, the divided kingdom, and predicted that no matter how hard they tried, they would never be able to reunite the empire again, and that it would remain that way up until the second coming of Christ, in which case... Um, you know, uh, God would set up a, a kingdom, uh, an everlasting kingdom, which would never be destroyed. So even from the standpoint of higher criticisms, uh, you can't get past the prophecies of the book of Daniel. And you can't give me a later date than the ones that the higher critics come up with because we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which prove that at the very least, uh, that book was in existence and circulated uh, around the first century BC. So now that we've already seen that the book has uh, prophetic implications and, and predicted how Rome would collapse and how the divided kingdom uh, would remain divided up until the coming of, of, of Jesus, uh, and we see that that's true even today, it lends credibility to the book of Daniel. Sorry, it lends credibility to the book of Daniel and, uh, and shows us that we can trust God's word. And uh, I would uh, throw out uh, the higher critic idea that the book was written in 164 BC, I would say that it was written in 357 BC. Um, but if I'm arguing with a, with a uh, agnostic or a, or a, or an atheist, uh, and they and they and they want to argue that uh, a later date, um, it still doesn't do them any good because it still would have prophetic significance. So that's just a little um, thing that you can share with people who um, who who uh, who question you on those on those particular points. But anyway. Let's go to uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 5 to 13. We're going to focus on those um, on, that, on that last section. The Bible says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? So notice it's the same question again coming like uh, from what we saw in Daniel chapter 8. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the, the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be t for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, I just want to pause there, because, again... We're seeing that same phrase pop up, time, times, dividing of times, 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 half a time. So we're talking about this three and a half prophetic years, which is the 1,260 literal years. Uh, in case you're wondering how we come up with that number, uh, based on the time, times, half a time, time would be one year, times would be two years, half a time would be, because now before it said dividing of times, so we didn't know how much do you divide it by. Well, now we know it's divided in half. So now half a year would be six months. So we're talking about three and a half years when you add it up all together. Now, remember that in the Hebrew calendar, uh, a, a year was 360 days. So if we do 3.5 times 360, you end up with the same 1,260 days, or in this case, it would be 1,260 literal years. And that, again, is, is a repeated theme that we see throughout Revelation, because in Revelation in chapter 11, you see the 42 months. How much is 42 months? Well, 40, 42 months is 1,260 days, referring to the 1,260 literal years. We see the 1,260 appear in Revelation chapter uh, 11, as well as in uh, chapter 12, I believe. 
Um, and then on top of that, you even see that phrase, time times dividing of time or time times half a time. So it again shows us the continuity um, and coherence between both Daniel and Revelation. Another interesting point is that we see the same thing that's described in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, described in Revelation um, chapter 10. Uh, let me give you an example of what I mean. So here in Revelation, here in Daniel chapter 12, it says um, that he saw a man clothed in linen by the waters of the river when he had held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever that it shall be for a times, time, times, and half a time or, or and a half. And when, so he, so he gives you a time period and he's saying, okay, it's going to be for this three and a half year period. And when he shall have accomplished the scatter the, uh, the the power of the of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now let's fast forward to Revelation chapter ten. Then we're going to come back to Daniel Daniel twelve to read the rest of it. In Revelation chapter ten, notice that John says, "And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire." And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. So at this time, he's not only over the sea. He has one foot over the sea, one, one foot over land. So there's a slight difference uh, this time around. But in verse 3, it says, And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven th thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which uh, the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel of which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Now, two important points, and what's interesting here is that this is a comparison between Daniel chapter twelve, verse seven, as well as Daniel chapter, sorry, as well as Revelation chapter ten, um, looking at verse, um, really from one down to seven. Now, a few points I want to bring out here. One, in Daniel, we know that there's going to be some time before things are finished. And so we're told time, times, and a half. And by the time Revelation chapter 10 comes about, though, it says here, there's time no longer. So in other words, by this time, that period had ended. And now we see that the voice of the seventh angel is about to sound and the mystery of God is about to be finished. So now Daniel picks up where, sorry, Revelation picks up where Daniel had left off, telling us what's going to happen when that time runs out. Another fascinating thing is that this actually solidifies the day for a year prophecy. So you'll remember, like, you'll, you'll see, like, for example, throughout the studies that we've done, I always talk about how whenever you have that exaggerated number of days, they actually are not days, but refer to years. And I, I usually will quote Ezekiel, uh, I think it's chapter four, verse six, where he says, I have appointed thee each day for a year, right? Think about it. If Daniel was referring to literally 1,260 1, days, that probably would have been, I mean, three and a half years would have been exterminated uh, long before even probably the Babylonian Empire would have collapsed, and certainly long before the Medes and the Persians Empire would have collapsed. But yet Revelation interprets that time frame referred to by Daniel as something that is occurring after um, the Roman Empire comes into, comes into existence. Because while John is exiled on Patmos, which would have been, uh, you know, uh, roughly around the first century A.D., when he has this vision concerning the future, he sees the angel come down 
and this angel raises a hand to heaven and swears by him that lives forever, that created all things, that there will be time no longer. So, if the 1260 days was literal, isn't he like hundreds of years too late? But when you factor in the day for a year principle, then you realize that he's talking about a time that terminates during the divided kingdom, not a time that terminates in Daniel's time if we were literally counting three and a half years. So that's just another evidence that kind of shows you that even in Revelation, um, as, as John sees all this transpire in vision, uh, these are things that have yet to happen and things that are terminating or, or coming to pass during the time of the divided kingdom. So going back to Daniel chapter 7, um, we see that these things are going to occur that we see in Revelation here after the divided kingdom. So 1,260 years uh, uh, you know, into the future, and it would terminate in 1798 like we discussed before. So from the time of the little horn, so yeah, we're, we're dealing with the time of the little horn and his reign. Uh, and remember that the little horn comes from the um, the Roman Empire. So again, that shows you uh, that, that we're dealing with uh, the time of Rome, uh, and then going into the time of the divided kingdom, all the way down to the end of time. So Revelation elaborates where Daniel left off. All right, so going back to Daniel chapter 12, I'm going to finish reading that, that, uh, that section. <clears throat> We left off in verse 7 because I wanted to make that point and to show you the correlation between Daniel 12 and Revelation. He goes on to say, <clears throat> And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of, of, of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So this time around, the angel seems not to explain to Daniel what's meant here. He says, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time of, that the daily uh, shall be taken away and the, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and uh 305 and 30 days. So 1335. Uh, so 1335 days. That's what he's talking about. Or 1335 years, literally. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1305 and 30 years, but go thou thy way till the end, uh, till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So in other words, he's saying, Daniel, you're going to be put to sleep by the time this stuff happens. But you're going to arise, you're going to be resurrected, and you're going to stand in your, in your lot where, you, where, you're, where your place is in the end of days. In other words, Daniel, I'm going to raise you up. So what's being talked about here? We know that the 1,260 days, referring to the time, times, and half a time, or time, times, dividing a times, uh, refers to the 1,260-year prophecy stretching from 538 uh, AD, where the little horn power arises, to um, 1798 uh, AD, which is when uh, General Berthier uh, snatched the Pope off of his throne and put the triple crown upon Napoleon. Actually, I just realized that I might have made a mistake here. Uh, I think I told you guys that the Book of Daniel was written in 357. I think I meant to say 537 BC. Um, that's when it would have been completed by. But anyway... Um, we see that the 1,260 years spans from 538 AD to 1798 AD. But now we learn about these two additional uh, time frames, the 1290 and 1335. Now, they're calculated be with different start points because it says that, it, that uh, the 1290 would be calculated from the time that the uh, abomination of desolation is set up and from the time that the daily is taken away. So um, that's like a whole nother story, but uh, this, this prophetic period should start in 508 AD when Clovis, the king of the Franks, converted to Catholicism and he paved the way, and this, this important event paved the way for the union between church and state, 
which held sway throughout the Middle Ages. So if we start the uh, 1290 in 508 AD, it brings us to the closing of 1798. And then when we go a little further uh, forward in time to the 1335 days, we end up uh, at the end of 1843 or roughly 1844. Um, so let me just uh, do, do some quick math for you here. Between the 1335 and the 1290, <clears throat> there are 45 days or 45, uh, 45 prophetic days, 45 literal years, right? If we start at 508 AD and we go 12, uh, 1,290 years into the future, we arrive at 1798. And if we add on an additional 45 years to 1798, that brings us to 1843. Or if you're talking about uh, six months, uh, you know, um, depending on the time of year, it actually might bring us to, uh, uh, to 1844. Um, so either way, it's bringing us uh, to, to the starting period where people begin to become more aware of the prophecies of Daniel and where they're studying particularly Daniel chapter 8 and the time of the judgment, the cleansing of the sanctuary. And so this was the time of the Millerite movement and, a, and it began a renewed study of, of, uh, of biblical pro uh, prophecies. Any way you want to look at it, when we look at society today, when we, when we look at all these things together, um, what we're seeing now is that we're getting closer and closer to the time of the end. Really, right now, the period of time that we're living in is the time of the end. And we're getting closer and closer to the close of probation and that time in which Michael is going to stand up and in which God's people are going to be resurrected. Um, so it won't be long uh, at this point. Um, we know that uh, Jesus is going to come again and he's going to um, defend his people. He's going to preserve his people. He's going to resurrect them and bring them to glory with him. And he's also going to punish the wicked. Um, so we've completed now our study of the book of Daniel, um, and I would urge you, uh, now that you have a basis in the book of Daniel, that you begin looking at Revelation, and now you'll start to see certain things that are, that are fulfilled in more recent times. Okay, uh, so that's all the time that we have for this evening. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Daniel and for these studies where we can learn about these end time events and end time prophecies and know that in spite of the things that we see going on around us, that you are ultimately in control and that you are steering human history in a particular direction toward the everlasting kingdom. We thank you, Father, and we praise you for uh, what you have done, and we pray that you would preserve us and help us, Lord, to be one of those who shine like the stars and um, who are counted worthy to be written in your, book, in your book of life. Guide us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Have a great week.